Well, I'm delighted to be here today um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, I think the presentations have been great. It's also really exciting to see, you know, at times upward of 180 people spending a whole day thinking about these things. So what I thought I would cover, hopefully this will be the uh, comic relief part of the uh, presentation, is let's just talk about algorithms generally. Uh, what are they? Why are they important potentially to forensic science? And if they are important, what are some of the challenges? So I, I've always hated speakers who start with a definition from, you know, Webster says, uh, but I did want to just sort of Google, what is the definition of an algorithm? What, how inclusive is it? And I came across a pretty good article uh, in Slate Magazine. And so I love this. Can I level with you? I'm not always sure what people are talking about when they say algorithm. And he responds, you're not alone. Honestly, I haven't always been sure what I meant when I said it either, but here's the absolute simplest definition. An algorithm is a set of guidelines that describe how to perform a task. Now, if you haven't read the Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, I really recommend it. He's a surgeon, a very intelligent guy, but also just a gifted writer. I, I dare you to buy the book, start reading it. If you don't like it, put it down and I'll, I'll, I'll buy it from you. Uh, but he talks about this idea that checklists make a lot of things better from cooking to aviation to medicine. And maybe for our purposes today, could they make it for forensic science? And so I went out on an image search thinking, let me find a few examples of a checklist in aviation. And I found one that I think is just really compelling. This is Neil Armstrong's glove from Apollo 11. And on that glove is a checklist for what to do when he exits the uh, spacecraft. I think that is just fascinating. And aviation has a long history, um, starting back, you know, probably 50, 60, 70 years ago with a plane trying to take off out of Texas where they still had the gust locks and the flight controls and it swooped up into the air, stalled and fell to the earth. It could have been removed really easy with just a small reminder. And so that launched the aviation community into needing a checklist. But algorithms also in a more modern usage um, tend to have a computer science feel or an automated feel. And that might be attributed to Ada Lovelace, who in 1843 published the first sort of algorithm to find the Bernoulli numbers using Charles Babbage's uh, analytical engine. Unfortunately, she died before they succeeded in running that algorithm. But she was honored later in the late 70s, 1980, the Defense Department set out to have a common computer science programming language, and they named that after her, the ABLE language. So why that, that connection to computer science, that connection to automation can cause some people anxiety. And for some of us who are proud of our craft as forensic scientists, it can make, make us ask questions like, why, why do we even need this? I'm pretty good with my microscope. I'm pretty good as an examiner. And so I think the thing to consider is there are some things that human beings are great at, and there are some things that we're not so good at. So I wanna give you a few examples by way of just optical illusions. You know, the OSAC has been struggling with the idea of something called an exclusionary difference. And it's based on a common sense notion that you don't need a robust research project to look at a cat and look at a dog and have someone say, those are different. The cat can't be the dog. That's an exclusionary difference. And certainly that common sense approach has great appeal. We love our lives by making those kind of common sense heuristic approaches. But we're not always good at that. And especially in forensic science, where we rely so much on visual inspection of things, so using the OSAC definition, we could ask, is there an exclusionary difference between the square there labeled A and the square labeled B? And unless you've seen this optical illusion before, you would say, absolutely, those are, those are absolutely different. The problem is they're not. They're not different at all. It's your eye anticipating that there's a shadow there from that green cylinder. But if you connect it with the grayscale, you see that that A and B are the exact same shape. It's hard for me to even convince myself looking at the image on the right. My brain wants to take over. But if you let anyone at CSAFE who's doing image processing point a computer at this problem, it's very easy. It just registers the grayscale in both places. 
So we're not so good at that. Here's another one that um, I encountered recently, really hurts my head. So we I can certainly ask, is there an exclusionary difference between the red ball and the green ball or between the green ball and the blue ball? But it turns out this is a very well-crafted optical illusion. And if you look carefully, the colored bars going over each of those images um, has been edited. So there's only red over the red ball, only green over the green ball. And the effect that has, if we pull those balls forward so those lines are not going over them, is that's what they look like. There's no exclusionary difference at all. But we're not good at this as human beings. So we rely on these kind of things in a lot of forensic science disciplines. Uh, in fingerprints, we think about minutia. We think about you know, bifurcations and ridge endings or dots or islands. And so we have to have the visual perception to say, is that dot bigger than this dot? So in this case, if we stare at it and think, is the orange dot on the left side bigger or smaller than the orange dot on the right side? But if you've encountered this optical illusion before, if you hold your thumb up to the screen to kind of act as a ruler for you, those orange dots are exactly the same size. So, you know, another one, if you uh, just saw Keith Morris's presentation in Firearms and Tool Marks, there's a, a lot, we rely a lot on looking at lines, looking at striations, but we're not necessarily that good at doing that either, right? Each one of these, it sort of plays on our inability the one on the top left there, those lines separating the white and black boxes are all straight. You can stick a ruler or a pencil or your phone up to the screen to verify. And the bottom left, both of those lines, the vertical one and the horizontal line are the same length. The red lines are not curved. And the one that, that gets me the most is this uh, Caniza Triangle, uh, that's named after an engineer that worked on the, actually on Pac-Man, the video game and, and the, how the optics work in that game or some, somewhat rely on this, this optical illusion. There's not a white inverted white triangle, but it looks like there is. We are, our brain just creates a line where there's not one. There's really just those black images. So if we're not that good at this, if we have inherent limitations, they're not because we're not educated, they're not because we're inexperienced, they're not because we're not well-trained, they're not because we're biased to try to solve a crime, they're just built into our biology, our physiology. We could certainly benefit from better image capture and image processing tools. So if you had the benefit of uh, seeing Hal Stern's presentation on blood powder analysis, we could you know, begin to wonder, so we got to look at that stain and, and say, Professor Plum in the library with what, the gun, the knife, or the candlestick? And this becomes a, a tricky problem. And then other types of cognitive bias can enter, right? If the crime scene photos already have a candlestick in them or already have a knife in them, does that predispose me in ways that I'm really that are really difficult for human beings to manage to think well maybe it's probably a candlestick and some of you have probably read austin hicklin who did uh the black box study on fingerprints about a decade ago who was one of the, the the principal authors in that study recently published this accuracy and re reproducibility of conclusions by a forensic bloodstain pattern analysis and although the results are not just atrocious they're not that good and in his abstract there, uh, both semantic differences and contradictory interpretations contributed to errors and disagreements, which could have serious implications if they occurred in casework. And so these things, we could probably benefit from some algorithms. We could probably benefit from some automation. For those of us that have been in the forensic science community a long time, uh, 30 something years in my, in my case, uh, or at least since 2009, you know that we've been in a struggle in a sort of cultural revolution to become more scientific. We're not alone in that kind of struggle. We can borrow from the lessons of the medical community. So in the early 90s, you started seeing articles about evidence-based medicine. And so this, um, this reasons the practice of evidence-based medicine is a hot topic, uh, gave us this graphic, and I think it's great. In medicine, sort of pre-90s, 
much of the evidence, much of the decision making was based on this level four and level three of evidence. So my, it's, my evidence is based on personal anecdotes. In my experience, I've had patients like this before. They get better when I do these kind of treatments. Um, or level three, I went to a conference and there's a consensus. All of us who are pediatricians agree that we should approach it this way. And I think if we're honest, and I think the NAS report would agree and the PCAST report, much of traditional forensic science, our evidence, our justification, our warrants for the claims that we make are hiding down here in level three and level four. The PCAST report came along and said, no, it needs to be higher. It needs to be like at that level two, two dash one or level two dash two, You've got to have evidence from controlled trials. Um, a randomized controlled trial in forensics would probably be impossible, right? Where we, we create an, a validation study and then we deliver it in a blind proficiency test way to laboratories where they, they don't even know they're participating in a proficiency test. If you saw Rama Meja's talk earlier today, you know that that's a beautiful idea and it's almost impossible. Peter Stout's um, quick to point out that we, we've got a laboratory full of people who are forensic professionals detecting, having an intuition that something is not quite right and wanting to get to the bottom of it will thwart, will just thwart almost any blind proficiency test effort uh, from the handwriting look to me. The, where they wrote that little note is not where they normally write it. It's just a very difficult problem. But so we're not alone. Medicine uh, has the same sort of challenges and I also think hiding in here is um, we can convince ourselves that we have expertise that we don't necessarily have. So let me give you an example from my time at the Defense Computer Forensics Lab. That was back in 2006, 2008 timeframe before iPhones, before mobile devices, if you saw Yong's talk. Um, and the bulk of our casework was on suspected child pornography. I had a room full of forensic examiners and we had a backlog. I was trying to figure out how they could go faster. And they said, well, it's not really the digital work. It's going through all of the pictures and determining whether or not they're child pornography. And so that raised two really important questions to me. Uh, one is, what makes you an expert in pornography? That sounds like the philosophical and legal question is uh, probably many of us have had a picture of our young, you know, six month old, totally naked, taking a bath on our desk. And no one would consider that to be child pornography. But the other question that was very interesting to me is what makes you think you're an expert in child? How, did you, how can you age children? And the reply is often, well, I've been doing this for five years. I look at a lot of the suspected child porn and I know what I'm looking at now. But I'd offer, you have no idea what you're looking at. You don't know ground truth. A nurse practitioner, a pediatric nurse practitioner who examines children all day, he might have some expertise. He looks at naked children all day long where he's got a medical record or a birth certificate. And so you begin to develop what's the range of 12 year olds? What's the range of 13 year olds? But a digital examiner doesn't have that experience at all. So it's it's tricky if we're relying on that level three and four evidence, we can convince ourselves perhaps that we have expertise that we don't have. So in our struggle and our maturity, uh, there was recently a, a, a white paper by the DOJ that suggested that, that really the problem lies that we're not metrologists. It's wrong to consider the forensic science metrology. And then the requirements of PCAST and NAS those attached wrongly. We, we, we really shouldn't have to live up to that. So I'd like you to consider a different way of thinking about that. If we were to ask James Taylor, are, are, are you practicing acoustics? He would probably say, no, I'm practicing songwriting. But if we also asked him, well, are you a scientist? Are you a forensic expert? Are you a sound expert? He would say, no. Um, acoustics doesn't really sell records. You can get a sound engineer in here, but they can't write, I've seen fire and I've seen rain. So if we want to claim that we're not metrologists, we run the risk of someone saying, well, then what are you? 
what are you? And we might be left by saying, well, we're artists. We're, um, we're not doing something that's science. So we, I don't think we want to claim that we're James Taylor in the, the forensic work that we do. The other thing we want to watch, watch out for would be if the eagle says, I'm, not practic I'm practicing soaring, not aerodynamics. But if the eagle's having a tough time flying, we would say, no, soaring is just a synonym. You are, in fact, practicing aerodynamics and learning where to put your wing and understanding lift and understanding the Bernoulli effect. All of those things are what make you fly. You are, in fact, practicing aerodynamics. So I think we want to be careful. Uh, we don't want to find a judge saying, so you're not a scientist, you're a songwriter. And we don't want to find ourselves insisting that we're soaring and not practicing aerodynamics. So if you've read the, uh, the DOJ white paper, I would offer that I think it's eloquent. I think it's rhetorical. It's persuasive. But I'd also suggest to you it's wrong. And if you want to see a really compelling response, I would direct you to Tom Albright. He was on the National Commission for Forensic Science. And he published a rebuttal in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I ask you to read it for a couple of reasons. It's careful, it's respectful, but I think that it's right. So why does that matter? Well, in order for algorithms to work, you have to feed it data, you have to feed it measurements. And so if we're going to take the next step of maturity towards you know, our version of evidence-based medicine, our version of more rigorous forensic science, and I think metrology matters and participating in algorithms really matters. So it's uh, been a pleasure and a privilege to talk to you today. I'm happy to take any questions in the chat as we move on and I turn it back over to Alicia. So I want to talk a little bit about the algorithms that, um, that CSAFE research have been developing. And um, Jeff's nice introduction made me uh, delete a couple of the slides that I had prepared uh, describing what algorithms are and so on. So let me jump right in and talk about algorithms in the context of forensic practice. And one thing that we, we always say, but uh, I hope everybody understands that we mean this, is that algorithms are never seen as a substitute for the forensic examiner. The algorithms are meant to be an additional tool that forensic examiners can use to carry out their work. And so the idea is um, that algorithms can be very useful because they, um, they do things that examiners cannot do. And Jeff was really uh, eloquent in this regard. I'll, I'll be much less fun. Uh, algorithms can do calculations can compute things that humans cannot do uh, simply by using visual inspection or, uh, or you know, other methods. So um, if we want to move to a place where we do uh, some sort of quantitative evaluation of evidence, uh, probabilistic uh, outcomes where we say, you know, this is the, the probability that these two things, these two items have a common source or the chances that uh, this, uh, this, the, the suspect was at the crime scene, or whatever it is that we're trying to compute, then the algorithms can do that, uh, whereas humans really cannot. Of course, algorithms uh, have to be reasonable in the sense that uh, they have to have some attributes that make them useful. Uh, one of the uh, things that make algorithms useful is uh, when they allow for some sort of examiner input. So either framing the initial query uh, in some way, adjustments, adjustment of some parameters or thresholds that the algorithm uses uh, in order to come up with an outcome, and of course, uh, the ability of the examiner to make the final decision. And so I will point to this as I move along the presentation. But again, humans are very difficult to replace. Some tasks that humans find very easy, algorithms have find very difficult, and the other way around. So this is supposed to be a happy collaboration between the human and the computer in order to make uh, better decisions. 
So the algorithms that we're developing in CSAFE uh, have different goals. Some of them are, um, and this is a little arbitrary on my part, but I am going to try and classify them into those that generate investigative leads or that help, um, help investigators think about what they should be focusing on and those that uh, are meant to quantify similarity between items or classify items, pairs of items into same class, different class, or what have you. So I, I'm not sure how many of the presentations you had a chance to, uh, to, uh, to attend today, but all of these have been discussed earlier. So every hunter, for example, is an app analyzer. And this one, um, allows examiners to look at forensic relevant evidence that is generated by the apps that may be uh, present in a suspect's uh, mobile device, for example. And that's all I'm going to say about AV Hunter right now, but if you are interested, Young One and his group would be the people to contact about this. Uh, Charles Falks just talked about uh, their the algorithms they are um, developing at UCI, and there were two different kinds of uh, efforts, but one of them is the retrieval, for example, of brand size matching. Um, so the matching by class characteristics of a crime scene image to uh, the entries in a database of impressions, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a second. In terms of algorithms that can be used to quantify uh, similarity or to classify uh, images into different kinds, we have, for example, the maximum click comparison algorithms and variants that have been developed by uh, So Young Park and collaborators here at Iowa State. Uh, this is to be used um, to compare outsole impressions, and I'll say something about that uh, later also. Uh, Heike Hoffman, Susan van der Plaas, and uh, a slew of students have developed algorithms uh, for firearms examination. Uh, again, those are meant to quantify the similarity between two bullets or two cartridge cases. Uh, Hal uh, Stern talked a little bit of, uh, ago about bloodstain pattern analysis. And um, Maria Cuellar and others in UPenn is working on algorithms to uh, compare tool marks tool marks to tools. And uh, I talked a little bit earlier about uh, handwriting analysis and several algorithms we're developing in that arena and uh, Danica Oman and myself are the ones working in that area. So um, the focus at CSAFE is on pattern and digital evidence, as you know. And so um, I'll talk mostly, I'll talk only about uh, algorithms for uh, use in the pattern comparison disciplines and in the in the remaining of this presentation. And this is an area that's pretty, um, that's I think pretty ripe for the use of algorithms because uh, in pattern comparison disciplines, examiners rely pretty heavily on visual assessment and on conclusions that are based on experience and training. And like Jeff just uh, said, Sometimes visual inspection uh, fails us, and uh, algorithms can can help in this regard. So there are algorithms that are already in use in um, pattern comparison disciplines. For example, any latent print analyst, I'm sure, has done a database search uh, using some sort of an algorithm. And uh, firearms examiners uh, use an IBIN system that uh, for cartridge cases and bullets. These type of algorithms actually don't uh, provide an assessment of similarity. What they do is they help the examiner uh, reduce the number of comparisons the examiner needs to make by providing the examiner with promising uh, potential matches, if you will. So reducing the number of comparisons by uh, just providing the examiner with a set of reduced number of comparisons to be made. A notable exception is FR stats that was uh, developed by Henry Swofford and others in the, while well, Henry was at the Defense uh, Crime Forensic Science, Defense Forensic Science Center. Um, 
this algorithm actually does provide uh, a probabilistic assessment of the source question for latent print analysis. Did, does this print match the reference print? And um, I'm not sure whether it's still in use, but this is a, this is a, a very sim, a very promising approach uh, that I, th I think is the only one, the only algorithm that was used for those purposes in actual practice. So um, let me start a little bit. I am not going to go into any kind of depth, but I'll just describe some of the work we're doing in CSAFE. I'll start with the footwear uh, analysis and the main tasks that uh, the algorithms we're working on at CSAFE address are the following. The first one is, if you have a smudgy, partial, very low quality crime scene impression, uh, that you found at the crime scene, can you try to match that impression to uh, a set of, of high quality impressions that you may have in a database? And this is uh, what Charles spoke about in the first part of his presentation. Uh, the second type of algorithms might serve to quantify the similarity between a crime scene print and a print from a suspect shoe, for example. And that is um, the other type of algorithm we're developing. So if you saw uh, Charles's presentation, this is going to be a familiar uh, slide. This is from his presentation. And so the idea here is you have a, a smudgy prints from a crime scene and uh, a nice test impression database. And so what you want to do is you want to search this database to see whether you uh, find a match for the smudgy uh, crime scene print. And this is based on what's called a Siamese network. So these are just two convolutional neural nets that have the same architecture and that are paired. And that at the end of the day, they produce some sort of a similarity score that tells um, the essentially some sort of a empirical probability-like statement of whether this uh, there's a match or not. And um, the results that uh, Charles, Charles and his group have obtained are very impressive. So here, for example, are, are some examples of smudgy prints uh, from a crime scene. And these are the retrieval results from the database. Uh, the one that's in green is the highest ranked one, the most likely match according to this algorithm. But you can see this is not an easy job. This, there's a bunch of prints that could have been uh, like the first one, the second one. Those are also very similar to the one that's uh, ranked the highest and so on and so forth. So this for this one, the, uh, this is the highest rank and so on. And so the question is, how well does this uh, uh, retrieval and matching algorithm do? And um, it turns out to do quite well. So again, based on a based on a specific benchmark benchmarking data uh, base, um, and looking at this receiver operating ROC curves, uh, the purple and the green lines are two variants of the algorithm that Charles and his group developed, uh, and they tend to do better um, than uh, the other existing algorithms. And so what this is telling you is, what's the probability that the actual match uh, is going to be in the retrieval set when the retrieval set is uh, between zero and 20 um, candidate matches? And so by the time you look at 20 images, the chances that among those 20, you're going to find the one you want is pretty high. Uh, a different type of approach uh, for footwear impression are the algorithms that we are developing to uh, compare to outsold prints. And so uh, imagine you have a question print and you have a putative shoe, so a known shoe and a question shoe prints. And you would like to know whether uh, these two could have, these two impressions uh, could have come from the same shoe. Initially, the first approach to this problem that we worked with was um, examiner driven in that the examiner would choose some areas of interest, in this case, uh, uh, um, signaled by these circles, the blue circle, the pink circle, the 
red circle. This was selected by the examiner. And so the question then is, can an algorithm find the corresponding circles uh, on the uh, reference shoe? So you start from the question shoe. Can you find the corresponding circles on the reference shoe? And once you do that, or the closest uh, circles in the, um, in the known shoe, and once you do that, can you extract, can you take measurements, if you will, uh, from using the pixels that are inside each one of these circles and the distance between circles and so on, and using those features, compute some sort of a similarity score. Well, this initial approach uh, was actually pretty good. Uh, we only focused on close non-matches. And um, when the two images were of reasonably good quality, we could get accuracy in the order of 90 some percent uh, in, order, in terms of uh, classification, same shoe, different shoe. But of course, uh, with very limited uh, testing. Recently, we've been moving to the case where at least one of the impressions is blurry or uh, observed partially. And so to create blurry impressions of the outsole, what we did is uh, we interposed pieces of paper between the bottom of the shoe and the scanning surface. Uh, and so what you see here in this picture, you have uh, a nice reasonably um, clear image of um, a 2D image of, the, of a shoe. And then the same shoe image with two pieces of paper between the shoe and the scanner, six pieces of paper, and 10 pieces of paper. By the time you interpose 10 pieces of paper between the scanner and the shoe, the image you get is pretty blurry and you lose a lot of the detail. And furthermore, just to make the comparisons more realistic, we, we used only the pixels that are inside these rectangles and ignored everything else as in we only observe this uh, blurry piece of an outsole. Well, it turns out that the findings are pretty limit the findings are pretty promising, even though again, uh, the testing is very limited. So when you have about, um, when you have 10 pieces of paper between the shoe and the scanner, we still have a sensitivity and a specificity around 97%, um, which, means that uh, most of the time we can actually um, identify the real shoe that left the print, uh, even when we only consider shoes that have the same brand model uh, size and uh, more or less the same degree of wear. In terms of bloodstain analysis, uh, bloodstain pattern analysis, again, uh, if you heard um, health presentation, uh, you know that the primary objective is to use an algorithm to classify patterns with respect to the mechanism that generated the bloodstain pattern. Um, I'm not going to go into details here, but um, you know that the first step in the algorithms that Hal and his collaborators are uh, developing is to represent a stain pattern uh, like this one up here that is composed of thousands of droplets uh, using um, ellipses. Once you have uh, the ellipses, and so the question is, how do you fit ellipses to a, a bloodstain pattern? That was the first part of their work. And in that first part of their work, they came up with an, um, an algorithm that, uh, that we're looking at the green over here, an algorithm that given a ground truth uh, a pattern of droplets, actually does fit the corresponding um, ellipses pretty well. So once you have those ellipses, you're in business because suddenly you can start taking measurements from those ellipses and doing metrology, the metrology that Jeff was talking about. And so uh, from an ellipse, uh, you can look at the uh, main direction. So that would be represented by the um, angle of the main axis with respect to the horizontal. You can look at the location that's represented by the XY coordinate of the, um, of the red dot. You can look at the relationship. You can look at many things, right? So you can look at the ma major axis and the minor axis and so on and so forth. And so if you have, um, so let's suppose you have these five measurements that you take from each ellipse that comprises a pattern. So you can have different types of patterns. One, for example, 
patterns created by impact, uh, by impact, by expiration, by cast off, by whatever. And for each droplet in each of these patterns, you can actually construct these measurements. The, and so once you have those measurements, there's many different things you could do. Uh, the way that uh, the type of algorithm that, um, that Hal and his collaborators are using uh, is actually a statistical algorithm. So um, they are trying to estimate the probability that uh, you would observe these data if the pattern uh, was created by an impact, uh, blunt force impact, or expiration, or cast off, or what have you. So that's a classification algorithm. Uh, you can also compute, do something, um, you can also use what they call a generative approach to uh, looking at these patterns, and that is um, a likelihood ratio type of approach. And again, I'm not going to go into any details whatsoever, but uh, it turns out that, for example, distinguishing between expiration and impact, the patterns left by expiration by, and impact type of uh, mechanisms, you can distinguish very well between those two um, with uh, essentially 100% accuracy if you're looking at uh, this uh, likelihood approach, um, this likelihood ratio approach. So um, firearms, this is another area where we have done a lot of uh, algorithm development. Um, firearms, algorithm, firearms algorithms or algorithms used for uh, evaluating firearm evidence relies on three-dimensional images of bullet lands or uh, breach face impressions on cartridge cases. And again, uh, two main objectives are uh, the develop algorithms. So the two main objectives at CSAFE have been to either develop algorithms that can compute the similar, quantify the similarity between bullets or cartridge cases, or since we are not the only people um, that are developing this type of algorithms, can we uh, help implementing others' algorithms, for example, the congruent matching cells algorithm uh, developed by NIST researcher, can we help with implementation by developing um, algorithms that are in the open, uh, that are open source and in the public domain, and that are very, very reproducible, that you know, given certain inputs, uh, always uh, produce the same outputs. So um, the comparisons between, let's see, where am I? So this is the land, this is the uh, land impression uh, from a 3D uh, comparison, uh, from a 3D Confoca microscope. And the idea here is to extract information about uh, the depth of the striations at a given cross-section, at a specific cross-sectional uh, location in that land. And uh, this is what we call a signature. And uh, if we have signatures from two different lands uh, and we align them as best as possible, then we can actually measure things. Again, this again is this idea of metrology we can measure, for example, the number of matches and mismatches of peaks and valleys. We can measure uh, the difference in the depth of the peaks and valleys. That We can measure the cross correlation. There's many different things that can be measured. We call those features. And those features can be combined um, to produce some sort of a similarity score. In the case of this bullet uh, algorithm, the features are combined using what's called a random forest which is um, an algorithm, a learning algorithm. It turns out that uh, the results are very promising, uh, at least with the type of ammunition that has been tested. And these, for example, are results that were obtained using samples generated by the Phoenix Police Department. This was an open set, meaning um, we knew that, uh, so each column here represents a barrel and each, uh, from each barrel, we got three reference uh, shots. And then we got uh, 10 question bullets, N, B, E, T, et cetera. And the question was, which barrel fired each one of these bullets? Where you see 
um, where you see orange, that means high similarity. So for example, uh, question bullet N had very high similarity scores when compared to the three chest shots from barrel A9, and then very low similarity scores when compared uh, with the chest shots from any one of the other barrels. Uh, B had very high similarity score with the three chest shots from barrel C8 and very low elsewhere, and so on. And then you can see that the last three question bullet Q, Y, Z didn't have high similarity with any of the reference shots from any of the uh, barrels. And in fact, none of the three reference shots from barrel U matched anything else. So these are great results, but the data have to be good. What do I mean by good? I mean, the images need to be uh, well obtained images of the surface of a bullet land. And so one, um, if these images are not good, for example, if there's a lot of mixing pixel, uh, missing pixels, or uh, the image is, you know, you're looking at the wrong part of the image, or what have you, then the results are not so good. And so can we understand quality of images? Uh, so this is some recent work that Heike Hoffman and her students are working, are doing um, in the last year or so. And so, um, can we automatically, if we have an image of a bullet land, can we automatically recognize areas that are clearly not striations or good striations? And that perhaps should not be, in, you know, maybe we need to do some sort of imputation of missing pixels, or perhaps we have to ignore those areas or what have you. And so Andy, uh, one of Heike's students, is in the process of training a neural net that can recognize areas in a bullet land that may um, that are of different types. So for example, uh, the green here would be the left groove. The right here would be, the right green here would be the right groove. Uh, the pink here might be break off, and so on and so forth. The gray here might be mixing, uh, missing pixels. So um, it turns out that this algorithm that Andy is working on, uh, you know, can be improved, but initial performance of the classifier is pretty good. So for example, uh, it recognizes groups reasonably well. It, out of the groups, there were however many, if you add all this up, this is how many uh, groups there were to classify as groups. The algorithm uh, correctly classified the vast majority of the groups as groups. Uh, same, for example, with the areas that are not striations, the algorithm correctly classified most of those are non striations, and so on and so forth. There's still, a, you know, anything that's off the diagonal is a mistake um, by the classifier, or perhaps um, are mistakes due to the labeling of the data. Maybe that's where some of these mistakes are occurring. But this is worth pursuing because it looks like we're uh, high bears onto something here. Finally, and um, algorithms are, one should not think of algorithms as a crank that one can just um, uh, turn. There's a lot of things that one needs to consider. Uh, are the algorithms valid? So how do we, uh, how do we know that algorithms that are uh, in use or that we propose are valid and should be used. Well, we need to not only worry about accuracy and reliability of the algorithms, but we also need to um, make sure that they're tested uh, ex exhaustively. So uh, the, uh, there are no, or there are very few situations that have not been considered when testing uh, and validating the algorithms. And we need to know what assumptions are being made. Uh, every algorithm has a ton of assumptions on which it relies. Uh, and um, lots of knobs that can be turned one way or the other and that can uh, significantly affect the outcome of the, um, of the algorithm. Uh, the issue of training data and what, how these algorithms have been trained is really crucial. And of course, understanding what the limitations of the algorithms are. When is it that we should not be using a particular algorithm? Biases are inevitable and they will creep in um, in many different ways. So, and some of the biases will have a huge impact on outcomes of algorithms. And so um, understanding how to correct or how to prevent uh, those biases is really very important. And finally, 
the question of ethical considerations. When should we be using algorithms at all? And uh, what are things that we need to worry about? And so that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I don't know why I cannot move. There we go. Thank you so much. I pass it on to Hal. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Alicia, and thank you, Jeff. Uh, those are great. Um, I think what we're going to do is I'll, I'm going to make just a few comments, no slides. Um, if you have questions um, or comments, I'll play the role of MC and you can put them in the chat. And Jeff, Alicia, and I, or anyone else who wants to weigh in, uh, can weigh in on, on the questions. Um, but so I just want to make a couple of remarks, less about the technical part of the kind of building of algorithms. Alicia gave some great examples of the work that's happening in CSAFE. But to talk about a couple of, uh, you know, the, the larger issues as I see them about how we might ultimately get algorithms into practice. And I hope Jeff doesn't mind. I hope he remembers, but I hope he doesn't mind if I begin with uh, an anecdote from a few years ago when FRSTAT was being developed um, at the Defense Forensic Science Center. And Jeff was uh, in the lead of the forensics unit there. Um, Karen Caffadar and I from CSAFE went down and met with Henry Swafford uh, uh, and he walked us through the method um, and, and we at the time made some suggestions, uh, some of which were taken in the, what ultimately came out as FRSTAT. Um, and, you know, we were really quite impressed with the work that had been done, but Jeff and I had uh, a, a few exchanges about what would it take for, you know, a statistician, say me, to endorse FRSTAT and say, you know, yeah, this is good. This is what we should do. Um, and we went back and forth a, a little bit because one of the things that I tried to convey is you have a set of data on which you develop the algorithm and you need to make sure that that's representative. And then if you have as FRSTAT um, does, a method that produces a score uh, purporting to summarize the evidence, you need to know whether that's, is there just one score or does it depend on features? And I don't have uh, prepared slides for the remarks, but I do wanna share, if I can find it, um, one, a couple of just singleton slides drawn from other presentations. Um, so here is one, whoops, perfect that you can hopefully see now, okay? Um, this is, comes from the paper that was uh, uh, recently, that was published about FR stats. And it's an example of something that I think about a lot, which is uh, just as a reminder, if you're not familiar with FR stat, um, it, it computes a score. And the data I'm showing here are from the development phase in which the higher scores mean uh, more likely match and the, so the lighter distributions that you see in these pictures come from known matching pairs of questioned and unknown, of questioned and known. And the uh, darker distributions that you see come from known non-matching pairs. So they should have lower scores. And you can see, as you would expect, based on what we know about latent print exam, is that the number of minutia that are put into the algorithm has a big impact. Uh, on the, dis the ability of the, on the separation between the two distributions. So if you have 15 minutia, there's almost no overlap between the same source pairs and the different source pairs. Whereas if you only have five or six minutia going in, less information, there is overlap. And the way that I think about some of the algorithmic work is if you didn't know that, right? So you don't work with fingerprints. You don't know anything about fingerprints. And you just have this large data set of some of which had five minutia and some of which had six minutia and some of which had 15 minutia. And you created a set of same source scores and different source scores, right? That would, you could use those distributions to assess evidence, but it wouldn't quite be the right approach because you'd be ignoring a key factor, number of minutia, right? And so I would argue the algorithm should condition on, in statistical terms, the number of minutia. And when I talked about this with Jeff, I said, you, you've done this work, you know it depends on the number of minutia, and you wanna know whether I as a statistician think it's now okay to use 
Well, I don't necessarily know whether all of the right factors have been taken into account. Maybe the physical size of the latent print matters. Right? I don't know. I'm a statistician. Um, yeah. So it, when science carries on, it's really up to the scientists to try and test their own method. And so I would argue, you know, we, we know minutia matters. Does size of print matter? So we might take different size prints of 15 minutia and see if the same score distribution and the different source distribution are similar for small and large prints, right? So you can imagine a series of such questions that you know, the community has to come up with. Uh, you know, so, so I think when we think about algorithmic approaches, we have to think a lot about what, uh, what you know, Mike in the chat put, you know, what's the reference distribution, if you will. So I think of it as what's the reference data? That is, what are the data we're using to develop the algorithms? And I'm going to stop sharing this one and go back to a slide that uh, Alicia shared from my presentation earlier today. Um, if I can make all this uh, work um, in real technology, in real time here. So let's see. So now let me share a different window. Okay. Um, so this is a slide um, from the presentation I gave uh, about an hour ago, uh, an hour and a half ago. Um, these are some data that uh, Michael Taylor in New Zealand, um, who's since passed away, but collected using interns in his lab. And so they had swine blood, um, and then they built a contraption and created impact stains, which were recorded on these posters, poster boards. Um, and uh, as I said then, if you were not there, um, the blue dots here are pins that were holding the paper up. So the red stains, which are a little hard to see, are the blood droplets. And so they generated impact patterns varying the object that was doing the impact, the amount of blood that was present. Um, and I think maybe, I'm forgetting the third factor, but maybe the distance from the wall or something like that, right? And so you get different impact patterns depending on those features. And then they did a similar thing with expiration where the student interns actually took this uh, fluid and, and spit it out using various, again, instructions. Um, and so, you know, everything I've done is based on this very limited set of data. Right. And so the question is, well, how does that compare to case work? And, you know, would an algorithm that was built to distinguish these lab generated impact patterns and these lab generated expiration patterns have the cap capacity to do as well in case based data? And where do we get case based? Right. So, again, not to belittle algorithms, I'm a huge, huge fan. And I think they're kind of, um, I think they're a great direction for us to be going, I, and I hope we get there. It just points to some of the challenges, you know, beyond the technical, which is to convince the practitioners to integrate the algorithms um, is some of the work that we're um, hoping to do in, um, in, in CSAFE as, as we go forward. Um, so let me stop there um, and um, allow if people have questions or things they want to talk about, um, you know, for, for uh, any questions for Jeff or Alicia or I to weigh in on, or Jeff or Alicia, if you want to comment on things I've said. Well, there was a question. Um, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. There was a question about uh, how do you have biases creeping in uh, when you have uh, this type of algorithms, you know, for shoes or for firearms or what have you. And I think what you were talking about was is exactly right, right? So the biases can creep in if you have the wrong training data, or if you have, or if you um, have sort of pre-processing of the data. So let's say you have an image with mixing, missing pixels and you use a specific approach to impute those missing pixels and then you proceed as if that was a complete image. I mean, those are all kinds of things that, um, that 
will make algorithms give different results if you change those things. You know, that's exactly right. And uh, one famous example that some of my colleagues on the computer vision well told me about was when some of the early uh, deep learning computer vision networks, which have just incredible results, that is human level results in ability to identify objects from images. Um, but some of the early versions of that, when they were trying to distinguish dogs from wolves, did really, really well. Um, but it turned out what they had honed in on was that the large majority of the wolf pictures were taken in snowy environments. And so it wasn't anything about the wolf versus the dog, you know, anatomy that was the key. It was the background that was the key. Um, so maybe uh, seeing no other questions, um, we can broaden the conversation um, and what we had in mind and what we had advertised that we would talk a little bit about different statistical approaches uh, that we are developing and some of the issues associated with moving them to labs, which we've done, um, but then to broaden the conversation to talk a little bit about ethical implications. And I don't know that we're gonna go the full three to four, um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Karen to kind of start that conversation. Um, thank you, Hal. And um, uh, I will go ahead and uh, share my screen. And um, while I'm doing that, I just wanna echo um, what Hal was saying about the importance of uh, uh, aspects, you know, variables that actually have a great deal of influence um, on, on algorithms or uh, outcomes. And uh, as many of you know, I used to work at Hewlett Packard Company. And when we were uh, called in, I, my experience has been that the engineers knew, you know, kind of what factors they felt were important. Um, and so it was our job to try to design experiments around those factors to see which ones were most important and which ones affected the yield of the product um, that was being produced. So I think that's always an important consideration and as Hal pointed out, it's kind of the uh, essential, um, uh, it's an essential need for forensic science to go forward is, uh, you know, that there's this back and forth in this collaboration. Okay, uh, so this talk actually, um, part of this talk is, is, was prompted by a uh, paper that my colleague Jordan Rodu is uh, writing or has written with his his colleague, and it was asking the question when when uh, is machine learning uh, appropriate or not? And uh, so I'll, this is a real brief outline here, and I'd like to thank uh, not only Jordan for writing this paper, but also. Henry Swafford's webinar that um, got me uh, thinking about uh, when algorithms would be appropriate. And it, as you heard uh, everyone being saying today, every, algorithms are everywhere, uh, targeting customers for purchases, uh, personalized medicine, uh, recommended uh, drugs, uh, treatments, procedures, et cetera, based on a person's profile, risk factors, and test results. And, I can't help mentioning when Jeff was talking about the um, uh, clinical medicine field has been down the route that I think forensic science is going down right now. Uh, it's hard to believe because I don't think anybody would have taken a vaccine if um, we hadn't had the clinical randomized double blind clinical trials, but it was not that common uh, in the 1950s. Uh, MDs just said, we can't, how could you possibly ask us to administer a treatment if we're completely blinded. And of course, that's just the, that's the point. Um, drug development, you know, which combinations of compounds, those use algorithms, autonomous vehicles, and of course, in forensics and trying to decide whether there's, you know, uh, the evidence matches the source or not, uh, certainly DNA sentencing algorithms and so forth. So it sort of prompts the question when 
um, are algorithms or are they not appropriate in forensic science? And uh, we can you know, think of two of them right off the bat in DNA. They've got algorithms to calculate likelihood ratios. Uh, by the way, different algorithms do give different likelihood ratios. That, that's been kind of an interesting finding for me that I've uh, discovered in working with Keith Inman at Cal State uh, East Bay. Uh, it, it, I think it's important to remember, this gets back to the metrology aspect that Jeff Salyards was talking about. Electropharogram peaks and locations are measured. There's an instrument that spits out the answer, but uh, it's certainly not perfect. Uh, all measurements are measured with error. We certainly hope data from electropharogram is that's going into an algorithm is measured with negligible error. But so what, what do we mean by negligible? Well, maybe even accounting for error, the conclusion would be the same. So uh, I'll also mention it's my, been my experience that the result of a DNA does not seem to be questioned very often unless there's a lab error and then they're, uh, they're, they're required to repeat it. The uh, second one that I know about is an algorithm for developing quality metrics. It is a lease you emphasize. It's a tool to assist the practitioner in the initial step of a forensic examination uh, to, in design to answer this question. Is the evidence worth the uh, examiner's time and resources to proceed with further analysis? And that prompts the question, how do you define worth? Uh, high quality might mean, yes, it's worth uh, spending the time on it in low quality might mean it's not worth it. And how do you measure that? Well, one way of measuring it would be to say, does the level of quality of, in the evidence indicate that there will be a high or low probability of the correct assessment? I think correct assessment, um, this issue comes up um, in reference to both Amanda Luby's and Heike Hoffman's uh, presentations about how do we handle uh, inconclusives. Uh, how is correct assessment determined? Well, uh, I think um, someone put in the chat box that, you know, be careful of when everybody agrees because they could all be wrong. So maybe consensus isn't the, isn't the best way of doing it. But I think as uh, uh, Robin mentioned in her presentation, ground truth is, is hard to come by and it's very, very hard to try to implement this in, in, in a, um, such a study in a real world environment. It's uh, certainly true, as it was true at HP in production. They don't want to halt the process to do a test. Um, I'll just emphasize again that quality metric is not rendering a final decision. It's only a tool for deciding whether or not to proceed. So uh, this is just to say the goal of forensic an analysis is to identify or exclude an individual as the source of the evidence. And maybe that, that, that would be a proper measure here, the probability of, of correct assessment. I wanna um, emphasize that the last slides here are focusing on black box algorithms for prediction, not for computing. Um, we, we all recognize the value of, of algorithms. You know, if you need to, calculate model parameter estimates or uh, quality metric scores or whatever, uh, we realize that uh, you know, there are step-by-step -step algorithms for doing that. What I'm really talking about here are these uh, machine learning black box kind of algorithms. That's what I'm gonna talk about next. So uh, as I say, uh, my colleague Jordan and his colleague, Michael Bioka, Bioki, uh, wrote this article that's um, actually posted on archive, when black box algorithms are not appropriate, principle prediction problem ontology. And they're asking this question, when can an algorithm be deployed in real world situations? And they're talking about general situations, but they do um, mention uh, uh, the asset, one type of algorithm, which is criminal sentencing. But here's what they wrote, extraordinary black box algorithms exist with so much potential to do good despite deep uncertainty about when and how to use them. For all of their achievements, black box algorithms have shown themselves to be unpredictably brittle in the real world, a consequence of how they're developed. And uh, the big challenge here is often we don't understand them. So, the authors wrote by understanding at least how they're developed and assessed, maybe we can understand what situations are more or less compatible or safe for their use. 
And as I say, the specific example that they carry forward is one involving criminal sentencing. So uh, they're, in considering that, they suggest these conditions for when algorithms may be uh, appropriate to be used. Uh, some of these, by the way, were echoed by Henry Swafford. Uh, and I believe Hal also mentioned this in his talk, a clarity of the assumptions used to develop the algorithm. So we saw that in the chat box, you know, is the distribution assumed to be Gaussian, for example. That's an example of, of uh, the need to be clear about the assumptions. Fairness, representativeness of the units in the population to whom or to which the algorithm will be applied. So uh, Alicia uh, brought up the fact that there's often bias in algorithms and that can happen, especially when the, uh, the training set is not representative of the population in which it will be applied. I seem to recall that, I may not have it, the right sign here, but I seem to recall that um, the autonomous vehicle got really confused when it saw something it wasn't expecting to see, you know, like a, a bicycle alert sign, or you, you put a, um, a horizontal line through the O of stop or something. It, it didn't recognize it as a stop sign. Um, assessment, and this is really important. How is the algorithm judged to deliver the correct answer? So this was related to when I talked about quality metrics, the, what would be the appropriate performance metric to judge the, the value of the quality metric. This is all sort of related to what we uh, call in statistics, positive predictive value. Uh, if one delivers an answer, what's the probability that it's correct? And of course, remember in the real world, only the recording angel knows what the true answer is. We're hoping that we have a high probability of getting the answer that she's written down in her little book, but um, that's probably in the real world situation, the best we'll ever be able to do. Um, adaptability, and this is really true, isn't it? Once an algorithm has been developed, what if the population on which it's being deployed changes? How does the algorithm uh, uh, change in response to changes in the population for which it was developed in the first place. Uh, have there been costs of uh, incorrect conclusions and decisions quantified? And is the justification for conclusions clear to users? For their specific example of criminal sentencing, they bring up another uh, issue. And one is judges may take into account motivation for the crime. Does the algorithm consider motivation? If so, how and why is such consideration justified? And moreover, if the algorithm fails, if an innocent person is sentenced for life or a murderer receives a light sentence, who or what is held accountable for the failures? Uh, so what conditions then would urge caution in using algorithms? Well, lack of clarity and assumptions used to develop the algorithm. Algorithm finds its use, uh, finds its way into use on populations for which it was neither developed nor tested, possibly never even intended. Uh, inappropriate assessment, the wrong metric. So for example, is, is uh, uh, someone noted earlier in the chat, they may, you know, two experts may agree, but they could both be wrong, possibly with a very small probability, but small probabilities uh, multiplied by millions of uses could be um, highly dangerous. Non-adaptability, the algorithm is static. Unspecified costs of incorrect conclusions or decisions. Justification for the conclusions are not clear to users. And especially accountability remains undefined, unknown, or unmeasured. So um, uh, uh, Radu and Bioki argue that the traditional common task framework for developing algorithms may not be adequate. And here's what they wrote. The common task framework provides an efficient environment for development. The data exists already. All analysts have access to these common data, so many people can work on the problem at the same time. Fast computation takes the place of proving theorems. Performance is quickly assessed using held out data. The, there are minimal consequences of a poorly performing prediction algorithm. After failure, analysts simply tweaks the algorithm. Fundamentally, the common task framework takes, a com, com, takes complex world-world problems, 
in sandboxes then. So I think hopefully we can do better with algorithms. Uh, start with stakeholders who define the prediction problem and uh, assess who is accountable for its success, failure once deployed, who's affected by its results. Craft the problem first, not the prediction task. Focus on the features of the problem, not features of the algorithm, and ensure transparency in all phases, the assumptions, the samples from the populations in the code. And that's all, thank you. Thanks everybody for the opportunity to uh, present today. So the question that we've been posed here is to consider the ethical implications of algorithms and when they should or should not be explored as an option. And my uh, and what um, I would pose to you today is that in order to do that ethical kind of um, contemplation that we have to think critically about these algorithms. And I just realized I should let you know that I'm keeping my screen off or my video off for the presentation just because um, that'll prevent my computer from exploding and I'll turn it back on for the Q&A. Alrighty, so onward. Oh, here we go. So for the last decade plus, uh, we've been focusing on scientific validity and reliability. For those of us who've been working in the forensic space, this has been our key focus and, um, and subsequent reports in, uh, regarding forensic science uh, have also focused on validity and reliability. But we've been seeing that as technology is getting, uh, is developing and advancing, uh, we've been seeing this in DNA applications, that the question may not be whether or not something works, but whether, um, whether we should be using it or how we should be using it. And right now we've, we're faced with a number of algorithms and AI technologies that have been dangerously flawed. We've been seeing that with facial recognition in um, the number in the uh, wrongful arrests that have taken place. But what do we do when they get better? Because we know that they will get better. And to answer that question, I will turn it over to Lucius Fox. Here he is confronting Batman about uh, a new technology that Batman has developed. Beautiful. Beautiful. Unethical. Dangerous. You've turned every cell phone in Gotham into a microphone. And a high frequency jet. You took my sonar concept and applied it to every phone in the city. With half the city feeding you sonar, you can image all of Ghana. This is wrong. I've got to find this man, Lucius. At what cost? The database is now key encrypted. It can only be accessed by one person. This is too much power for one person. That's why I gave it to you. Only you can use it. Spying on 30 million people isn't part of my job description. This is an audio sample. If he talks within range of any phone in the city, you can triangulate his position. I'll help you with this one time. Consider this my resignation. All right. So here Lucius Fox is confronted with a highly accurate and reliable technology. And his concern is not about whether or not it works, but he's asking at what cost. And okay, we're advancing. Here we go. So to answer that question, I'll state that my primary um, thesis here is that with regard to our contemplating ethics and algorithms is that justice and equity implications of algorithms matter as much as their validity and reliability. And so how do we, um, how do we work through these justice and equity implications? Well, let's use a case in point. Uh, for those of us working um, in forensics, 
We've heard the name Francis Galton. He's often associated with the study of fingerprints, but he was also the scientist who initiated the study of eugenics. And eugenics is uh, using genetics to link race with social traits or social behaviors. And um, Galton wasn't finding a welcome home for his uh, area of research in the UK, but he found a home in the United States. And the United States had a U.S. eugenics records office. It was based at another familiar name, the Cold Spring Harbor uh, Laboratories. And this office was considered the cutting edge at the time. It started what I think might be the first genetic database in the United States of analytical index of traits in American families. And not only did it produce research, but it also uh, was a public policy office. And the U.S. Eugenic Record Office contributed to policies that enacted miscegenation laws, uh, sterilization laws, and laws that disenfranchised racial minorities, immigrants, and poor white populations. This research um, became attractive and was an inspired Nazi eugenics research. And this office was closed in 1939 because of the U.S. discomfort with how the Nazis had taken this U.S. concept and, and enhanced it elsewhere. So Cold Spring Harbor has had a reconciliation with its history. It's posted the eugenics archive on its uh, website. And so if you want to learn more, I direct you there. Uh, the curator of that particular um, exhibit said that the eugenics records office was built around a very systematized ideas that still might be seen as legitimate today. And if you think of the stereotypes that are associated with different groups of people, you can see how that, um, that, that lives on. And at the time, this was widely accepted as legitimate science. So hindsight gives us um, the ability to, uh, to to reject this kind of research. But at the time, how did eugenics gain legitimacy? How was it deemed valid? And why didn't people question its use? And I think that part of the answer is that the users or the people who were commissioning this work weren't really interested in how it impacted the population because the people targeted by the eugenics those who were out of power. And they were the groups of people who were least able to push back on any orthodoxy of science at the time. And in social science, this phenomenon is called the criminology of the other. David Garland writes in his book, Culture of Control, that there is a criminology of the other, of a threatening outcast, the fearsome stranger, the excluded and the embittered. One is invoked to ruin crime, to allay disproportionate fears, to promote preventative action. The other functions to demonize the criminal, to act out popular fears and resentments, and to promote support for state punishment. So when we can separate ourselves from the people upon whom algorithms will be used, we can separate ourselves from the harms or the consequences that might come from them because they are not us. And Megan Hollis writes in uh, her response to a systematic review of CCTV studies that she makes the point that we haven't had enough research on how different subpopulations are bearing the negative impact of these prevention technologies, these uh, um, predictive algorithmic uh, surveillance type of technologies and how some communities may be bearing that more than others. And so there is, to think through the issues of ethics, there is an area of study called ELSI, the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications um, that has been attached to a genomics research. So in 1993, the National um, Institute of Health established the uh, Human Genome Project as well as um, the ELSI program. And James Watson for his complex uh, history with eugenics, um, he did call for NIH to establish this research program. And it, uh, Congress mandated a budget for it to come from the human genome research program. And as a consequence, there have been legions of bioethicists that have grown up with these, with uh, 
these the evolution of DNA technologies and have been able to comment on them. Now, over the years, the work of LC programs have focused on privacy, on education, and uh, primarily in the area of healthcare and clinical care. Um, but their legal, regulatory, and public policy issues haven't really tackled the issues of structural racism that have been at the historical core of genetics research and the use of genetic databases. So where do we go from here? Well, I would pose that LZ is not enough. It's a great start and it's wonderful that we have that foundation, but we need to think more critically about algorithms. And technology design is part of the issue. We know that it's implicated by the databases that are used, the degrees of validation, the homogenous designers who embed codes with their biases, the use of measures that reflect normative binary ways that we think in criminal justice, guilty or innocent, match, no match. And because of my technical, uh, my internet connection, I, I'm going to skip over this video, but I really encourage you to um, find this uh, TEDx video um, on Ruha Benjamin's talk. Uh, it's available on YouTube. She's a Princeton sociologist who's been focusing on the relationship between innovation and equity, particularly focusing on the intersection of race, justice, and technology. And here she talks about discriminatory design and how biases get baked into the development of algorithms and codes and, and how that impacts um, biotechnology in this context. And the way that we disrupt this discriminatory design is to make sure that the impacted communities are at the table up front early on in the development phase. And that's how we can ensure that there's more of a democratic process with, with how we uh, develop these algorithms. I think at the heart of discriminatory design is this idea that we can create technological fixes for social crises, whether the crises have to do with housing or health care, public safety or education, rather than dealing with the underlying conditions, we create short-term responses that often get the issue out of sight, out of mind. And these responses too often locate the problem inside kinds of people, like the so-called loiter, rather than deal squarely with the political and economic conditions that create the need to sleep on a park bench in the first place. So if we think broadly with this idea of discriminatory design, just as a park bench reflects particular social values, so too is the lab bench and medical research imbued with a range of values. So with respect to the biotechnology rev revolution, the kinds of questions that researchers ask, where they go looking for the answers, and who they consult along the way are all crucial for us to consider. Another way to think about this is that is to ask whose voices are missing at the lab bench as important decisions are being made. Because I think without careful consideration of this, we really risk reproducing existing social inequalities, whether it has to do with race or gender, class, disability, nationality. We unwittingly design it in two new biotechnologies. And so what I want to suggest to you is that the customer is not always right. That is to say that the interests and the concerns of the most affluent among us should not unduly govern the decisions that affect everyone. In fact, I would say that we have to actively seek the input of those who are potentially harmed by new biotechnologies. And so with that, what I want to do now is just switch gears a little bit and share three stories of discriminatory design with you. 
as a way for us to begin to think about how we might design differently. So, so much better coming from Dr. Benjamin. Um, and she, uh, so here she's asking us to take action and to move forward with purpose when we're thinking about these technologies and technology development. And, uh, and this quote from Isabel Wilkerson and Cass talks about how, what happens when we don't take action because evil asks little of the dominant caste other than to sit back and do nothing. All that need it needs from bystanders is their silent complicity in the evil committed on their behalf. So how do we take action? What should we be thinking about doing um, when it comes to developing emerging forensic technologies and perhaps even the ones that already exist? Well, um, we should be taking a critical approach. And a critical approach is one that accepts that technology is not neutral. It's not, it doesn't appear to us objectively, but that it's the product of social and political forces that produced it, that it has normative implications on dimensions of power and inequality that need to be evaluated. And for us working in technologies that impact the criminal legal system, that the foremost inequality that's reproduced by technologies involve race, and especially ones that are used in surveillance practices. And so as we think through technologies, we should be asking whose agenda is being reproduced, who benefits from an algorithm, and who's harmed, who will be implementing this, and what controls exist for their use. Currently, there really aren't any. And how does this play out in a racially biased criminal legal system? And Dr. Benjamin's solution was to democratize the technology design and use. And we know that the design of technology is part of the issue here, that, um, that how it works is based on, um, on the databases being used, the degrees of validation, the homogenous designers that embed code wouldn't th that in bed code with their biases, the use of measures that reflect our normative bio, uh, binary way that we think about criminal justice. And we know that technology, uh, the tech sector has this motto called move fast and break things. But what if moving fast and breaking things broke people? We haven't been able to rely on tech developers in the past because their culture wasn't oriented to thinking about long-term implications of their technology. So apps, softwares, and algorithms are released quickly. Bugs are resolved through updates or, or forgotten after the next great app comes around. And the problem is that in the criminal legal system, someone has been harmed or a case has been impacted by the time we discover problems. And on top of that, we don't really have a system designed to look back at old versions of software to redress the harm that could have been produced. And Jonathan Taplin, who wrote, the, uh, um, who wrote this book, Move Fast and Break Things, and looking at how tech com companies have impacted democracy, says that part of our role as citizens is to think more closely at the media surrounding us and think critically about its effects, specifically whose agenda is being promoted and whether it's the agenda that will serve us best. So, how do we do this? How do we incorporate all the voices at the table? And um, you'll see that the, the, some of the solutions or the suggestions that I'm going to present here are very similar to the ones that Karen came up with. And uh, this is a slide that comes from a figure um, in a chapter that I'm working on in my capacity as a graduate student that will appear in a global evidence-based policing textbook soon. Um, and it calls for the creation of community technology oversight boards. And the idea is that you integrate all the practitioners and a diverse range of practitioners in every sense that um, police, prosecutors, public defenders, among researchers, the whole gamut of folks that would be able to opine on the design and impact of technologies and among community stakeholders, um, including public interest groups, and most importantly, affected communities, because we can't develop our norms with regard to use of technology unless we include the values of everyone who is impacted and included in this problem. So phase, the first thing that um, needs to happen is 
to identify the problem and select technology to match the problem rather than this technology in search of a problem that we often see in the use of predictive policing algorithms. Um, that, uh, that the testing and use and implica implementation of the technology should be done together with this group. And, um, and when results are coming out, that together this group can identify whether or not uh, there are issues that can be improved to, to, that can be ameliorated to improve the functioning of this technology in a just and equitable way, or if sometimes the answer is not to move forward with the technology. And, and lastly, that when, um, when there are changes, when there are harms identified, that there is a process in place to deal with it. So moving forward, I'm hoping that we can think about forensic methods and technologies with um, using kind of a dual track of evaluation. So both the scientific metrics at, of validity and reliability, but also using justice and equity metrics to evaluate how they're implemented. Because these two um, types of evaluations are related. And as they're being implemented, that they need to be done with community engagement, transparency, equality of access, and a duty to correct and notify. So this is the way that I think that we can all meet the moment that, that our country has been crying out for since the murder of George Floyd. And I'd note that uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson, the Deputy Director of OSTP, co-authored a paper called 10 Simple Rules for Responsible Big Data Research. And, um, and here she, uh, these are the 10 rules summarized. And I would just point out number one, to acknowledge that data are people and can do harm. And I think so often as we think about databases, uh, think of genetic databases, that as they grow, we, we begin to devalue the human element that contributed to the development of those databases. And so in terms of forensic algorithms and the implications there, um, the recent NIST Foundation study on DNA mixtures should cause us to rethink how probabilistic genotyping results are reported, interpreted, and what caveats we need when, um, when that, those results are being given. Um, other questions that we might raise are, when we use likelihood ratios, they really give degrees of inclusion. And increasingly, it makes it harder and harder to fully exclude people. And I have had colleagues who've seen um, cases moving forward with a likelihood of 40 for DNA. And, and so what, what can we do to prevent that from happening? And what if we reframed how we calculated these likelihood ratios? For example, with degrees of exclusion, or maybe there's another way that we can be rethinking and reframing how we um, how we interpret these or how we design these systems. Um, what standards must investigative techniques meet? We know from wrongful convictions that um, that early in the investigative phase, investigators tend to fixate on a particular suspect, and because of cognitive biases, exclude information that's exculpatory and put more weight on inculpatory information. And there's been this kind of dismissal of the need to validate investigative techniques because they're in this investigative phase where everything can be somehow cured before people are harmed. And, um, and I think that we need to rethink that. Why don't we have a robust duty to correct and notify practice? What investments are being made to develop the databases that we need to ensure that we have valid, accurate, just, and equitable algorithmic technologies? And what information needs to be publicly shared about validation studies? This is something that NIST uh, uh, DNA mixture study proposed. And to what degree are validation studies being done and what should we be expecting? So, the, there are many questions that um, we need to be working through. And I think the challenge is that when we think about algorithms, we think about how we can make things faster, but to ensure justice and equity, we do need to slow down and think through the, comp the implications of technologies as they're being implemented. And to quote uh, another 
uh, to quote a famous scientist, concern for man and his fate must always form the chief interest of all technical endeavors. Never forget this in the midst of your diagrams and equations. So thank you so much. I'll have, I'll share the uh, PowerPoint so you can take a look at these references. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to open it up for questions or discussion, um, both for Sarah and Karen in this the second half of the session, but also for Hal, Alicia, and Jeff, if, if other thoughts have popped up. Um, I'd like to open it up for all of you to comment or ask questions. I see there's one comment uh, from Amanda in the chat. Sarah, this came in during the last portion of yours. Uh, I don't know if you're able to see that and if you want to address that. Um, hold on, reading slowly. Uh, Okay, so, um, right, right. Um, so I think that uh, if my quick reading interpreted this question correctly, that there's a challenge with using statistical uh, programs because, um, because giving a number could influence the, uh, the fact finders and that um, it may cover or it may kind of um, prevent people from uptaking all the other limitations um, and, um, and, and other ways of um, describing the results of the analysis more accurately. Um, I think that this is something that we need to think about. And you know what uh, Henry gave this great presentation on the role of technology and people. And there are times when we need more people, and there are times when we need more um, more technology. And um, and how we present evidence to fact finders um, is is a huge component of that and um, and not just to fact finders, but also in reports and how reports may or may not be, um, be reflective of all the complications and all the important details that relate to an analysis. And so I don't have an answer um, for Amanda. Um, but I, I do think that this is something that we need to discuss. I think that um, how results are shared is something that CSAFE is working on and, um, and that it's something that we can commit to together as a community. Yeah, maybe I'll jump in here as well. Um, I think Amanda's point is an important one. There's, a, I think it's an open question as to whether putting a number on it or having an expert say, you know, I've done a lot of cases and this is an identification. It's an open question as to which of those is stronger or, or what the jury would say. But I, I think what's really important to me in both of those settings is, you know, characterizing the uncertainty. That is, what do you know and what don't you know? And they are in the number side of the world in the likelihood ratio. You know, I think there's been some really nice uh, work done that shows probably greater sensitivity than most of the statisticians realized that there would be. That is moving from a normal distribution assumption to just that it was a symmetric distribution can have a big impact on the likelihood ratio. And the second piece on the number side that comes up a lot is, uh, and came up in some of the presentations today, is that there's a giant calibration question. That is, you'd like to know, for anyone who saw my talk, our first attempt, this is ongoing research, at building likelihood ratios for blood stain pattern ends up with likelihood ratios that are, to be completely honest, be beyond DNA. And I have a hard time believing that they're that you know, compelling. Um, so I think it's a limitation of the data that we're working with that you can clearly distinguish these sorts of impact patterns from these sorts of expiration patterns you know, with near certainty doesn't mean that you could do that or would want to do that in practice. So I think Amanda's question is exactly right, but I think it applies both on the numerical side and on the expert testimony side is, you know, how do we more accurately convey what we know from what we think? And, uh, and I think a lot of Sarah's points, you know, filter into that. Those are really good points. And, and just jumping in here as well, um, the uh, expert 
uh, witness that's another example of where uh, I think Brandon Garrett has done a number of studies where uh, when an expert witness stands up there and says, this is the way it is, you know, juries believe it. And so that can be the same kind of uh, problem. The other one is, uh, you know, Amanda does raise a good point because the statistical community is a little um, frustrated by the fact that there are uh, many journals in the profession for which if your study does not show P less than 0.05, forget it, you're not gonna get it published. And that really wasn't the intention of significance testing. But, uh, you know, Amanda is right. If, you know, it shows up as a statistical method, people um, uh, believe that, yes, it is statistically significant or no, it is not. And I, I don't think we want to communicate that either. But as Hal says, that likelihood ratios, p-values, you know, they all depend on data and data have uncertainty. And so I think we do need to do a good job if we come up with these algorithms or uh, approaches of communicating, um, uh, you know, both what the results may mean as well as what the uncertainties may be. So thanks for raising the question. Hey, Hal, if I can just also add, I, I think Amanda, I agree she raises a wonderful point. And in some ways, I really hope that it's true. I hope that the lack of buy-in is because practitioners are worried about the results being overstated. Um, I would suggest that, that it may not be true. I've certainly talked to some fingerprint examiners who say, we don't need these stinking statistics. I know a match when I see a match. This is just slowing it down. It's confusing my customer. And so I hope Amanda's right. I hope the people I've talked to represent the minority and there's a much bigger concern about overstating. But then I'd also offer, given our long and storied history in forensic science of language like match to the exclusion of all others, zero, zero error rate, we, we often offered really overstated testimony that the absence of the member, given the typical jury pool, they might just sort of infer a number. And it might also be much bigger than the number we would give them. But I, I think it's really great that Amanda raised that point that just because we put a number on it doesn't mean that we're not misrepresenting the evidence. Of course, and I'll jump in if I can. <laughs> Any statistician worth his or her um, degree would never provide a single number without some sort of an assessment of the uncertainty around that number. So that's one thing. The other thing is that uh, I think, um, you know, that where numbers have been provided, they have been in DNA, forensic DNA analysis, and then you get likelihood ratios in the order of bazillions. Um, I wonder how people might react, for example, with a, let's say, latent print. Uh, likelihood ratio that is like, let's say, 98 instead of a bazillion. So there's a calibration that needs to happen, right? So um, and the understanding that except for DNA, we're never going to get this humongously large numbers. And that, you know, in some situations, a likelihood ratio of 150 is probably very high. Uh, or, or confirmatory of one of the two um, hypotheses, uh, even though it's not in the millions and millions. Um, <clears throat> I just, uh, I think the more information we have from experts like all of you is, is it's really good. I do. And the unfortunate part is that, you know, it's, it's always a, you know, for lack of better terminology, a crapshoot as to how much the fine fact finder understands. Okay. So we're trying to educate. Okay. But you also have to consider the fact that it's not just experts. I mean, juries or, or judges, whoever the fact finder may be, um, do the same kind of weighing, if you, if you will, of regular lay testimony too, as to credibility. So coming from your perspective, whatever you could provide us 
uh, to take care of the science world is going to be really great because they've also got to evaluate, evaluate the credibility of those people that aren't experts like you are. So the more we can get to satisfy uh, the fact finder on, on what should be the uh, true and just outcome, the better. So I have a question for Sarah, if I may. Uh, so I, you know, I, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. But uh, my question for you is, um, how do some of the things you talked about apply to things, for example, like the bullet comparison algorithm? You know, when you think about it, it seems that those are less um, worrisome in a sense, right? I mean, you were not recognizing faces. Uh, so what should we be worrying about from your point of view when we're developing this type of like object type of algorithms? So you're right. A lot of the issues that I raised um, were uh, with identity type of or um, uh, kind of social prediction mm -hmm. uh, type of technologies in mind. And with, um, with object related algorithms, I guess I would, um, I would say, and as someone who uh, doesn't do that research, um, it's easy for me to just say that, um, that that uh, just having, exploring kind of all the different possible ways to express a conclusion or to, um, to, to, to analyze the data and, um, and, and provide results, if there is a way to um, express things differently. And, um, and it may be that the way that we're doing it now is ultimately the way that works best with, um, within the, the confines of the limits that we have in the criminal legal system. Um, but I, I would be interested in, um, in, in other ways of expression that, um, that aren't focused on degrees of inclusion. And or or how as um, how as a community we can ensure that if uh, that we have this we can demarcate like when exclusions happen and how to ensure that that um, that's communicated and that that's done uniformly. And what range of information can we not do anything with? And then, and then, so kind of the meaning of all of the numbers that get produced um, in a way that's standardized and um, and and um, and can be implemented. So um, so it doesn't. Um, I guess so. Um, so there, there, there's a clear communication of what that evidence says. Yeah, and you know, Helen in the chat made a really good point. For example, thinking about, you know, let's suppose you have a great algorithm that has good positive predictive value, but is really bad at exclusions. That would be a, that's a really excellent point. Um, yeah, it's a, you know, I was in, in thinking about what Hal, so Hal mentioned something today. He said, you know, if you think about FR stats, one thing that affects, if you will, the performance, not the performance of the algorithm itself, but the conclusions you can draw was uh, the number of minutia you were working with. I sometimes wonder what is the equivalent thing when we're thinking about firearms, for example, and like how well says um, that is something that the experts, the, the, the experts in the discipline have to say, uh, we the statisticians find it very difficult to think about the thing. Hey, Alicia, if I can add something here. We have a I couple noticed, of uh, 
Jeff, can I interrupt us? We have a couple of hands up. Oh, on. sure. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, Maria and then Robin. Do you want? Thanks, Hal. Yeah, I think, um, Robin, I saw you raise your hand. I'm wondering if you're going to say something similar to what I was thinking. But I think a lot of it is going to be the usage of the algorithm, right? Like if there's, if there's contextual bias, um, affecting the human examiner and the way that the human examiner is um, interpreting data. You know, if there's task irrelevant information being brought into the, the information that the examiner is receiving. Um, and then we're saying, okay, don't use the examiner, use an algorithm. That could also be, you know, and then a human is still involved in these ways of, like Alicia, you were saying, it's a complement to the human. I think it could sort of play a part in it. Um, there could be bias that's um, sort of caked into the, the whole system. Um, but then also, um, yeah, I think that we have to think about how it's like the usage of the algorithm. Like I, I think maybe there's some issues with how the data are collected and which data are used to train and so on. I think that's a little harder to say in terms of like, if there's gonna be discrimination against certain groups. But I think the way that it's used, like by humans in the system, I think that's something that could lead to the same same kind of problems as we have um, in other parts of the criminal justice system. Yeah, that's it, Robin. Thanks. That that's related, actually. Um, let me take my hand down. Um, I think another area that's relevant is actually, which is one we've discussed a lot in SaySafe, is the are the databases which you raised, Sarah. Um, in your talk, the databases we use. Um, I haven't framed it this way in my head. I framed it just in terms of how representative databases are in terms of sort of how what you were saying um, about using them to construct likelihood ratios, et cetera, is it too small? But for many types of things, what, where, you know, et cetera, there are associations between items and groups, items and demographic groups, perhaps, which is it's worth adding to the consideration as well as sort of when we think about size and representative of the databases we're using when we um, build algorithms, or when we use algorithms more than when we build them. So we're almost at time. Jeff, do you want to come in and give us the last word here? Well, so I just wanted to comment I threw in the chat. I think in the forensic science community, we are misusing positive predictive value. And it's important. I think often when I hear forensic science people use it, they mean like something that has a low false positive rate. Positive predictive value though, is often used in the medical community. And in order to calculate it, you have to know the prevalence of the condition, right? So it's capturing that nuance. I might have something that has a false positive rate of one in 10,000, but if I'm using it to detect a disease that has a prevalence of only one in 10,000, that means out of every 10 positives I get, only one of them is really going to have the disease. In forensics, we almost never or possibly never know the prevalence. What's the prevalence of matching bullets? What's the prevalence of murderers? We don't have that information, so we're probably better sticking with specificity and sensitivity, false positive, false negative language. Mm -hmm.